Hello and welcome to the Urbanist Agenda, the podcast where we promote superior housing options. This is Jason from Not Just Bikes, and I'm joined today by my co-host Justin Rosniak from the Well There's Your Problem podcast. Hi, Justin. Hi, it's Justin. I'm here. I'm here on the podcast. <laughs> podcasting is very unusual for you. I can hear the beer opening already, so this is going to be a good start. Oh my God, this is true, yeah. So, what are we here today to do? What are we going to do today? <laughs> we are here to talk about the superior form of housing. Row houses, also known as townhomes or terraced homes in the UK, a type of housing that I have lived in for a large part of my life, actually, and my personal preference. But we can get into that in a little bit. Actually, I have always lived in row houses, except for a brief period in college when I lived in the dormitory. Right. <laughs> so I've never not lived in a row house. So maybe I'm biased. I don't know. <laughs> it could be, but you have no desire to live in something else. So, you know, this it could true. just be yeah. that you've hit the superior form of housing. Yeah. Nailed it day one. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I brought Justin on. Because he lives in the row house capital of the United States, which is the great city of Philadelphia. Yes, it's us in Baltimore. Right. But I think we do it better than Baltimore. I'm going to be honest. There's some mid-Atlantic kinship here, but I will say that the Philadelphia row house, I think, is better than the Baltimore row house for a lot of factors, including that it's cheaper. <laughs> All right. I will assume you're totally unbiased in yeah. that assessment. So I assume everybody knows what this is, right? Like these are houses that you live in the whole thing from top to bottom, but you are generally connected to another house on the other side. Yeah. The general format of the row house, I think is, you know, well known around the world. You have a house, it's connected to the houses next door. There's a row of, you know, 10 or 20 in a row. You have the whole house, you have a backyard. In my case, it's usually something that's a little older. Or it's usually made of brick, but it's a common format. I mean, when you get into the specifics, you can really sort of get a taxonomy of row houses going, you know. So like here in Philly, there are some that are as many as, you know, 250 years old now. Right. There are some which are brand new, but the row house as a format, I think is very familiar to everyone. I'm always being told that American cities are like that because they were built after cars. So I didn't realize cars have been around for 250 years. That's incredible. Well, yes. I mean, you know, famously, Stephen Gerrard was hit by a car and died. <laughs> and that's how he left all his money to the United States. No, wait, that's not quite how that worked. It was, well, it was a horse and cart for one thing. <laughs> so Philly is quite an old city, actually, and there are parts of it. I haven't been to Philly in a very, very long time, and I was not there for very long, even when I was there. But I do remember that it has these extraordinarily narrow streets in the old part of town. Yes, I mean, not even in the older parts of town. I mean, they are spread out all over the place. So you will see some of your very narrow streets. These are like 20 feet wide. You may have a 10 foot wide cartway if you're lucky, you know, and then they're flanked by houses called Trinities. Right. And that's because these are three room houses. The house is just three rooms stacked on top of each other. Right. A lot of times you have a basement. That's where the kitchen is. And these were like sort of old fashioned, like worker housing, like servants housing even, which says something about, you know, back in like. 1790, you know, you could be a servant and have a whole house. And now it's like you struggle to have an apartment. Um, <laughs> oh, if only we could go back to the good old days of 1790. Obviously, there are some caveats there. There are probably a lot more people in each room than you would want to have. But <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about row houses, townhouses, townhouses, what I normally call them. And when I lived in the UK, they were called terrace houses. One of the things I want to say right before we start, though, is that it is funny when I talk to North Americans about this online or even in real life, which, believe it or not, I do sometimes talk to people in real life. Not often, but it does happen. And bad idea. Don't. Do oh, that. I know. I know. <laughs> totally don't recommend it. I mean, it's cool to go touch the grass between the grassy tram tracks, but then coming back in. Exactly. So it's funny when I talk to North Americans because there's kind of this like inbuilt assumption that single family homes are superior. And that's what obviously everybody wants. And then and everything below that is a compromise. And maybe you take that compromise for some reason. But I actually really would not want to live in a single family home again, because I find it to be a maintenance nightmare. Like I hate having to mow the lawn all the time. And I am not a gardener. Everything I touch dies. <laughs> so I have no desire to go back to that 
idea that I have to maintain all of this useless land around me, which only exists because of this old idea of trying to emulate the English country home. And I don't want it. So not only would I not want to live in a single family home again, even if I had the ability to, or even if there was one near where I wanted to live, I wouldn't want to take on that maintenance liability anymore. So I actually really honestly, truly prefer living in row homes. Yeah, because you sort of get the best of both worlds, right? You have your own house, you have a lot of space, but also you don't have a huge amount of land to take care of. Right. And the land you do have, it kind of takes care of itself because it's not like visible to the public necessarily. You may have a front yard. I mean, I live in West Philly where generally speaking, houses do have some amount of front yard and right. a big rambling front porch. But that's my landlord's problem, not mine. I mean, my backyard <laughs> is, it could be spruced up a bit, but you know, the vegetation is taking care of itself. There's just a massive pokeweed back there, which prevents anything else from growing too big. Um, problem solved. Yeah, it just took over everything. And I'm kind of like, I like it, so <laughs> I'm not going to mess with it. I think that's it. Like, there's many different types of row home that exist. And actually, you sent me over a great PDF from Philadelphia that talks about the different row homes in Philadelphia. And I'll put that link in the description if anyone's interested in taking a look. But it has examples of different designs. And you can have ones with a little garden if you want it. You can have one with a porch if you want to, you know, sit there and yell at the neighborhood kids when you're older, which is, you know, something that I am definitely getting to the age for, which is great. It's a good idea to have a porch so you can yell at kids. I look forward to being able to do that eventually. I think so, <laughs> right? I mean, like, I think every crusty old man should have that. So I actually really, really love the row home. And of course, I think the other thing that's the obvious benefit is the densities that that allows for the city. Yeah, I mean, if you look at like strictly from an urbanist aspect, what's the advantage of the row house? It's like, well, you have all these wonderful benefits of having a single family house. But also, you can cram an enormous amount of people in a small space with a row house. Right. It's really good. I mean, I think... Where is that link? I gave you that document there. Yeah, exactly. The one I send you, you now send back to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is podcasting. You know, but you look at these densities of like in East Pashunk here, and it's over 40,000 people per square mile. And all those people have their own houses. It's not like everyone's crammed into some kind of huge apartment cube. Everyone's got a backyard, even. <laughs> it's remarkable the densities that row homes are able to achieve that are on par with, like, certainly those towers in the park that were, like, that 1960s ideal that everyone would live in these huge, tall towers and have yes. their cars parked underground and there'd be a park around it, which actually never turned out the way they were envisioned to anywhere. I know there's places in Toronto where they had those. They're really not the greatest places to live. There's places here in Amsterdam, the Bijlmer comes to mind, that was just kind yeah. of a failed experiment. You got a couple which are relatively successful, like Co-op City in New York. Oh yeah, that's true. You know, and then you have some of the union built ones actually are still doing very well. Well, I guess they were built correctly. Yes. <laughs> so the thing is that you can have those, in some cases, extremely high densities, but it doesn't feel that way when you're walking down the street, right? You're not like, it doesn't feel like you're surrounded by these giant looming skyscrapers. It feels very, I mean, it's still, I guess they say human scale. Yeah, I mean, if you go to South Philly and you're like surrounded by, well, there's a specific kind of row house down there called the working man's house. It's usually 15 foot wide, 90 foot deep lot. It's a two story row house. And it's just, you know, uniform for blocks and blocks. You just have these row houses. It does not feel oppressive or uniform, especially because these buildings have some age on them. So they've been customized by their owners a bit, but they were all the same when they were built. Right. You know, but it's very nice. And you have all these people there, which means, of course, all you also have lots of like restaurants and shops and stuff to do, you know, and you wind up generally being pretty familiar with your neighbors in this situation. It has lots of advantages, I would say. It's good. It is good. And I mean, ultimately, that's the thing with living in the city is that you want a lot of amenities nearby within walking distance. And doing that with single family homes is just a lot more difficult. But with row homes, yeah, again, yeah, you've got a whole house to yourself. And yet you can still walk to all the cool stuff nearby. Like I remember when we lived in London, England, the first time we lived in a row home right near King's Cross, which were actually, as I later learned, were built for the people who built 
King's Cross. The workers who built King's Cross lived in these row homes. They built them first, and then they built the station, and then, you know, they moved out and went on to the next job or whatever. But they were really nice. So this is like, you kind of walk up a half story to get in, and that was the ground floor. There was a floor above that with a couple of bedrooms. Down in the basement, they had put the kitchen. And it was just a very comfortable home with a nice little backyard. There was no front yard in these cases. They were right up against the sidewalk, but that was a really nice house. Yeah, I mean, some of the ways these things got built are interesting. I just learned this today, actually, going off of, you know, constructing the row house for the construction project. One of the ways they would get built in Philly in like the 1800s was that it was like, okay, we're going to build a row of 10 houses. And the way we're going to compensate the workers is by giving them the houses. Hmm. So, you know, one house goes to the Glazier, one house goes to the Bricklayer, one house goes to so on and so forth. Then the rest go to the landlord. That's how you get a row of 10 or 20 houses done without spending money. <laughs> I mean, that's not a bad deal, to be honest. I mean, as long oh, yeah. as those workers can still feed themselves in the meantime until they have a house. It keeps your workers invested in quality of construction. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. So again, it's funny when I talk to North Americans about this, obviously, if someone lives somewhere like Philadelphia, where these are common, or, you know, in Brooklyn or something with the brownstones, that's one thing. But when I talk to people in other places, they'll come out and say like, oh, you know, I don't want to have like my neighbors right next to me, I'm going to hear their baby crying all the time and stuff. And that's just not been my experience in row homes at all. The soundproofing capabilities of three wives of brick are very good. <laughs> That's been my experience, too. Like, I never hear our neighbors to the side, ever. Yes. Yeah, it just doesn't happen. I grew up in a townhouse from the 70s right. in Northern Virginia. That one had some problems. Yeah, actually, that reminds me. I lived in a townhouse the first time I lived in Silicon Valley when I was doing an internship there. And I lived in this, I don't know if people have seen the movie Office Space, it was pretty much exactly like what that guy is living in. That movie hit way too close to home, by the way. There was so many things in that movie that were exactly the way I lived in California. But were you on such good terms with your neighbor, though? <sighs> yeah. So, <laughs> so like, there's a joke in that movie that you can hear the neighbor all the time. The neighbor's yelling through the wall, and he says, can't you just come over here and pretend we can't hear each other through the walls? And it was <laughs> like that. And I think, really, that just comes down to building codes, right? I mean, yeah. it's as simple as that. You can build shitty wooden buildings that have no separation between the neighbors next to you, but you certainly don't have to. There's something messed up about how much our society currently relies on light timber construction. I mean, especially in huge apartment buildings, that stuff scares me. I'm going to be honest. That is kind of weird. We haven't had the big one yet, but eventually we will get the big one where a whole neighborhood of five ever ones just goes catastrophically into flames. I think you've <laughs> talked about this on one of your podcasts in the past that like they talk about these things being wooden buildings, but they're really not so much wooden buildings as they are oil glue buildings. Yeah, we're constructing these apartment buildings with engineered lumber, oriented strand board, right. glues, which are based on petroleum products, which are keeping wood chips together. Right. You know, and then it's like, all right, we put a lot of fireproofing on top of this, so it's fine. You ever see one of these things, <laughs> if it goes up in flames, it tends to happen while it's under construction. The fireproofing is good. I just think that the underlying concept is terrible. Yeah. Especially since you know, look in Europe, you have mass timber now. Mass timber is actually good because it's so dense that it's difficult to set fire to. Right. And then other countries in the world, you are building stuff with, you know, concrete and maybe terracotta blocks. Yeah. Or you're building stuff with just concrete in general. The light timber construction thing is unique to the United States and Canada. They don't even do it in Mexico. They think it's too unsafe there. Yeah. I mean, well, the U.S. and Canada have a lot of forests and they're like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, here in Europe, when I see stuff going up, it's made either of concrete or of what looks basically like cinder block. And I can tell you that when you build homes out of these things, you can't hear anything. Actually, I remember a few years ago, we were in Toronto over Christmas and New Year's Eve, and we were staying in a new build condo. It, it couldn't have been more than about three or four years old. And this is concrete structure, the way that they build condos in Toronto these days. And this is not a row home, obviously. This is one of those big, like 30 story, 40 story towers with lots of apartments. And we were in a two bedroom apartment. And I remember it's New Year's Eve, like literally New Year's Eve. Everyone's having parties. Right. There's fireworks going off. I can't hear a thing. And I went out to the hallway to throw out some garbage down the garbage chute at about, I don't know what it was, probably like two in the morning. 
And when I went by the neighbor's door, I could hear that they were clearly having a raging party. But this was right next to our bedroom. But when I was in the bedroom, I couldn't even hear it unless I literally pressed my ear up against the wall and really strained. I could barely hear them. But outside their door in the hallway, it was clear that they had music going. They had lots of people over. There was yelling and screaming and everything. So, I mean, it is possible even in apartments to build things that are like bank vaults. Yeah. Soundproofing solved problem, it turns out. If the guy who (laughs) built the building decided they wanted to do it which they don't always do. (laughs) Well, that's the trick. I know that some parts of the United States are a bit allergic to building regulations. You know, it infringes on the freedom of the developer to extract the maximum value possible. So yeah, international building code is not very good, I would say, as a code in general. Yeah. International building code, meaning it is used in the United States and Canada. (laughs) I do Um, love that. It's... (laughs) It's like it's like baseball, right? The World Series. Yeah, the World Series, yeah. <laughs> That's so difficult. Anyway, I don't buy the noise argument that people talk about. I have lived in older buildings where they have apartments three stories high or something like that. And you do sometimes hear your neighbors above you, but I never, ever, ever hear neighbors in any place that I've lived. I never hear neighbors to the left or right unless they're literally drilling into the wall. Yeah, I would definitely say the noise argument, the noise is not as bad as you would think. But the only thing is, you know, in the United States, if you're renting, you don't choose the quality of the building you live in. Yeah, that is true. (laughs) If I were building the building, certainly, but, you know, I'm probably renting something. You may wind up in a noisy situation and there's just nothing you can do about it. You can't go and say, hey, you should have built this building to much better standards. Yeah. You know, because the landlord is just going to laugh at you or more likely it's a big corporate thing that's just going to send an automated email to you. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for your concern. This is a no reply email address. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah, that's the trick. It really is difficult to build the noise proofing after the fact. You basically have to gut the place, but you also want to like put sound between the joists and things like that. So it's a non-trivial thing to do. But if you make people build them right from the get-go, it's not significantly more expensive and it's much nicer for all the people who live there. But, you know, building codes, people, building codes. Building codes, yes. I mean, I will say I don't hear my next door neighbor. I do hear my upstairs neighbor. But I like her, so I don't care. (laughs) And it's mostly just the cat running around at night, which now I also have a cat who's running around at night, so it's like, it's fine. Yeah, that's a wash. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, so tell me a little bit more about, like, what you'll see in Philadelphia, because, again, I haven't been there in a very, very long time, and I'm not that familiar with the city, to be honest. So Philadelphia is the city of homes. You know, one of our row houses was actually built in situ for the 1876 Centennial Exhibition to say this is what the home of tomorrow will look like. But you have many types of row house. Some of the first ones were built in what we now call Old City. I think one of the first rows, actually. Well, I guess maybe step back a second and say, well, what was considered a row house? You know, because you had sort of these townhouses that were built very early on in Philly. William Penn laid out the city with the idea that it would be a green country town. Once he sold off the lots, they were immediately subdivided. We got this sort of standard for 15 to 18 foot wide row houses, Mm. you know, and then initially they were sold off to individual buyers who built their own individual house. We sort of eventually get this concept of let's build a whole row of houses at once. One of the first ones was on Sansom Street in what's now called Jewelers Row, which was recently demolished for a skyscraper whose financing fell through. Yeah, that sucks, man. Yeah, uh, I'm going to be honest. Back then when it was happening, I was active on the Facebook urbanist group and I was like, it's going to fall through. Nothing is going to happen. All of you are idiots for carrying water for this project. And I was right. (laughs) Yeah, you've been around. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, development of the row house is sort of this idea that you build a whole row of houses at once. Starts up, you have big row houses, you have small row houses, you have row houses for rich people, you have row houses for poor people, you have row houses that were built continuously from you know, like the 1700s to today, you can still build a row house. This is not one of those cities where it's like we have very strict regulations against building anything that's not a detached single family house. Right. You can still build a building that's in the sort of general row house profile today. Is that through the whole city or in the older part? Pretty much the whole city. That's nice. Yes. Except in parts of like Northeast Philly, which are much more suburban in character, 
most of that's built out. There's not a lot of new construction there anyway. Mm -hmm. But essentially in the whole city, you can build something that looks and acts like a row house. And it works. Housing prices are not very high here. And that's the trick, right? I mean, the, yeah. the row house obviously has the benefit of being quite inexpensive to build because of the land costs and just the fact that, you know, it's surrounded by other homes too. That was one of the reasons why they were built in the first place, right? I mean, as you said, the original lots may have been sold off, but then they were quickly subdivided. Yeah, most of the city is like that. Places were sold off wholesale and then subdivided and then people built you know, row houses on that. And then sometimes they were subdivided again. There was a lot of row houses from like the 1700s that, you know, then got redeveloped again at some point in like the 1890s. We don't have a huge amount of development like that anymore because zoning is stricter and so right. on and so forth. And the city went through a pretty nasty decline up until like 2010 or so. But largely we recovered from that, you know, I mean. Yeah, losing all your manufacturing will do that to you. Yes. Not even losing it. There's still a lot of manufacturing. It's just much less labor intensive. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, fair enough. One of the things that I've always enjoyed when living in row houses is the energy cost, because there's obviously very nice insulation to either side of you, which is great because you're not basically oh, yeah. like leaking heat out everywhere. Yeah, that's one of the fundamental things about row houses that, you know, you have a party wall on either side, mm -hmm. the partition wall. And that means that your neighbor's heat is helping to insulate your building and you're helping to insulate their building. Yeah. It's a symbiotic relationship there. And it reduces your heating costs just because you have less exposed area. Now you can have like, again, there's multiple kinds of row houses. Some of them are continuous down the block. I live in something called a twin. So each house has three walls. Uh, and then there's a gap between each pair of houses. Hmm. So my energy costs are a little bit higher, but... It's still good because you still got a whole insulated wall. Right. These things work very well. But the other thing that I find compared to, say, an apartment, which is obviously same thing, you've got the uh, walls that are shared. The thing I found with a row house is that it's also very easy to get a cross breeze coming through if it's hot. I can open the front windows and the back windows and I get a nice cross breeze through the whole thing, which is often quite difficult to do in an apartment because you usually have like a hallway in an apartment. So you can't get the cross breeze going right through the building. Yes. I mean, it's very easy to just ventilate. I mean, I'm going to tell you this. It's June 21st. It's the middle of summer. Right. I have not installed my window air conditioner yet because it just hasn't been necessary. It's been a little bit unseasonably cool here, but also like it's just so easy to ventilate this just with opening windows and having a fan running that it has not been necessary. Right. And I find the same thing here in this house in Amsterdam. We open the front and back windows and the breeze. Actually, sometimes the breeze gets so strong. The other day, it knocked a mirror that was hanging off the walls. We had to close the window a little bit. Like, it sometimes opens <laughs> yeah. it up and it's like this wind tunnel that comes through your home. So if you want to air it out, it's very easy to do. I was about to say, get that wonderful outside air. Stop breathing. I don't know, whatever it is that's indoor air quality problems. Give me outdoor air quality problems. Right. Well, as long <laughs> as those Canadians aren't sending you their wildfire smoke. Yes. Yeah, uh, that was annoying, but we didn't get it as bad as New York City. Right. Also, I live near a relatively major arterial road, so theoretically, I'm constantly breathing tire dust, but ah, well, whatever. That's, that's what you want right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. It feels better. <laughs> and you know, the other thing, I mean, I don't think people who don't have kids, I don't know if they'll appreciate this, but the other thing I really, really like about row homes over apartments is that they have multiple floors so that you can send the kids upstairs if they're running around and being loud and stuff. They're kind of out of your hair. You send oh, them upstairs, yeah. job done. I don't think I would like to live in a place that didn't have multiple floors. Yeah, it's irritating. I mean, I'm going to be honest. So I live in a row house, but it's a very big one. Mm -hmm. So I have an apartment, which is just the first floor, which means I have access to the backyard. No one else does. Having multiple floors is very, very nice. I am sort of a second floor person. I'm not a first floor person. I am compromising here. But <laughs> yeah, having multiple floors is nice. You have a basement, so you can set up your model train set. You know, you have all this stuff. True. It's just having space. Space is the nice thing because apartments are so small a lot of the times. Not all of the time, but a lot of the times. <laughs> That's the trick is that a lot of apartments <laughs> in North America have been built and are being built lately, but they're all like either studios or single bedroom apartments. And we are seeing in Toronto an absolute mass exodus of families out of Toronto. A very good friend of mine actually from elementary school is an economist in Ontario doing housing policy called Mike Moffat. 
And he has lots of information on Twitter and online about the research that he does on housing. And it is shocking to see how many families are leaving Toronto. And a big part of that is because of the housing crisis is just getting to be so ridiculously expensive. But also they're building all of these condos. Condos are going up all over the place. I think at one point Toronto had more new projects under development than any place in North America except for New York City. But they're almost all condo buildings. And they're almost all one bedroom apartments. Yeah, I think it's maybe a blind spot in urbanism is that a lot of this urban living or these urban apartments which are being built right now, they treat urban living deeply unseriously. Yeah. It's like, all right, you are a single person or a young couple without children. All you need is a one bedroom. We're only going to build one bedrooms forever. And if you want kids or you want more space, fuck you, go to the suburbs, buy a car. <laughs> <laughs> I am jealous of like, you know, people in Chicago, for instance, who have these massive apartments everywhere, but we don't build like that anymore. No. We barely build apartments at all. And because of just the economics of how few apartments are built, it's very difficult to build a big apartment or the way the building codes work. It's difficult to build a big apartment. As much as I'm on team row house, I'm also on team really big apartments. We need to go back to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that as well. I mean, really big apartments are perfectly fine for families too, or multi-generational families or multiple people living there, roommates and everything else. And you know, I've lived in those kind of things. But obviously when I lived in those kind of buildings, they were all old because they're not yeah. being built anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem right there. I think it's a good point that you said, though, that they just don't take urban living seriously. In North America, urban living yeah. is very much thought to be like, okay, you're in your 20s, and yeah, once you grow yeah. up, you're going to, you know... <laughs> you're going to move to the suburbs. You're going to move to the suburbs, that's what you do. <laughs> and there's not really this seriousness taken towards that. You see it in lots of things, too. You also see it in, like, new schools aren't being built downtown very often either. And, yeah. You'll own nothing and be happy. No, I want a row house. <laughs> yeah, right? I want to own my row house. Screw you. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. You'll own nothing and be happy. I get that so often in my YouTube comments. I actually put that as a banned words, that phrase, because it was so dumb. Guaranteed, <laughs> if anyone says that, they're the same people that are like, you're a WEAF shill. <laughs> yeah, I'm, like, I'm here to prosecute Agenda 21. <laughs> Well, I did name this podcast The Urbanist Agenda a little bit to troll them. So, yeah. you know, there's that. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's just so ludicrous. I wish that the urban living could be taken more seriously in North America, because obviously I think that's a good idea. I kind of felt like we couldn't live that way that we wanted to live as a family, which is part of the reason we moved to the Netherlands in the first place. And here in the Netherlands, when you look at new developments, it's almost always row houses. There are lots of condo buildings going up in Amsterdam. That's mostly because Amsterdam's kind of built out, right? Like Dutch cities don't sprawl that much. They tend to have very strict regulations around preserving farmland. That's mostly the reason why they don't sprawl as much as they do in other places, like, for example, Belgium. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's mostly because of those regulations to protect farmland. And so there are restrictions on where things can be built. And like in the land in Amsterdam, when they're redeveloping, they often put condo buildings. They don't tend to be as large, as tall as they are in, say, North America, where you get these 30, 40 story buildings. They tend to be the kind of 10 story buildings, even when they build them. But I did notice, for example, even in Amsterdam, there's a new development called Houthavens, which is an old haven, port area. That's it. I, sorry, <laughs> forgot the English word for it. <laughs> but they have the six to 10 story buildings. But then they also have these sections that are row houses. And the best part is they're completely car free. And these are unbelievably amazing for families because when I went there the first time, it was incredible. It was like they've got all of these row homes set up. They were all either two stories or three stories. I think there were two stories on one side, three on the other or something like that. But then they're facing each other. It's only about, I don't know, maybe five to seven meters wide little street that's completely pedestrianized. And it was basically just all the kids in the neighborhood playing together. And the parents were out like having some drinks. And it was like, this is awesome. I would love to live like this. Yeah, well, you have this sort of, I hate to use a urbanism word, but gentle density. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I genuinely hate yeah. all urbanism phrases. It's like I was, I yeah. was looking the other day at this article that was about road diets. I mean, what a terrible oh fucking name that is. Road diet. Who yeah, wants to think diet, about going on a diet? Anyway, sorry to interrupt, but I hate all urbanism <laughs> terms universally. They're all terrible. 
gentle density, you were saying. Gentle density, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's nice that you can achieve a lot of this and you're not like talking about breaking the bank in terms of we're going to build a 700 story building. It's going to cost 800 bajillion dollars. The rent is going to be $400,000 a month. The Ross, like, I think it's just the ideal form factor is the thing. You know, it ticks all the boxes. It's not very expensive. It's not expensive to build or maintain. It just works, you know, and you don't have to put in a huge amount of infrastructure to sustain it. You know, we're not like talking about a neighborhood where I need like a whole subway system to sustain that density. It's like I have something like a frequent bus. Right. Or streetcar suburbs like we used to build back in the good old days of North American urbanism. Completely reasonable to like walk everywhere. Mm. It's completely reasonable to have, you know, a pedestrianized street because you just aren't generating that much traffic. Right. And that's the trick, right? I mean, it's that you're not generating that much traffic. And so that also yeah. makes the place much nicer to be in because it's not a place where every rush hour the streets are just jam-packed with high-speed cars. Yeah, I mean, my local street, Baltimore Avenue, I mean, it kind of is jam-packed, but mostly with trucks, which is irritating. Right. Trucks and trolleys, but that's because it's kind of the only trucking route through this area. Right. <laughs> One of the other things that you reminded me about when you were talking there about the development of things, the other thing with row houses is that smaller developers can develop them if they're allowed to through zoning. It is possible to build a small row of row homes or to buy a couple of single family homes, bulldoze them and create a row of row homes. This is something that can be done by small and medium sized developers. It doesn't have to be the big corporations that come in and buy the big plot of land and stick the 40 story condo building in there. Well, this is one of the blind spots of urbanism. I don't know if I've fully developed this thought, but like Smaller buildings are good because they're more accessible to a wider variety of people, like in sort of an economic sense. If you have a lot of small buildings versus a big building, those small buildings are going to have different tenants. They're going to have different owners. They're going to have so on and so forth. You build a big five over one building these days and it's like, okay, I have one commercial space on the right. ground floor. And if I don't get a grocery store, I'm just going to leave it vacant. <laughs> you know, if you have, you know, 50 row houses and not all of them have retail spaces on them, but the corners ones do, you know, you can have a little convenience store, you have a little restaurant, you can have a little and so on and so forth. I mean, I have a building down the block that has a bar and the piano studio and the laundromat in it, you know, and it's kind of like... Piano studio and a laundromat, what else do you need? Exactly, right? Well, they mostly used the, the bar. bar. I was going to um, say, <laughs> <laughs> the bar was actually the more important one there. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're building these really big buildings, it's much less accessible to people trying to start businesses or something because, again, you're like... I am holding out for the big name tenant. Right. I am not going to lease this to the little guy. And, you know, not to get too sympathetic to small businesses, but I would prefer to have a variety of services rather than one. <laughs> yeah, and that's the trick, right? There were problems with that in Toronto a few decades ago. I remember when I was living there, they were building these new condos and the developers were putting like one enormous tenant across the entire building and they actually had to push them through there. I mean, the way Toronto would do this, Toronto would have like fairly restrictive zoning, knowing full well that they didn't want that restrictive zoning, but then they would use it as a bargaining chip for the developers. They say, well, we'll remove these yeah. ridiculous zoning restrictions if you just do this, this and this for us, which is just annoying that 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 is the way yeah. it works. But anyway, and then they uh, were yeah. using those to get these developers to build more smaller tenants in the bottoms of these buildings, because again, it was exactly that. It was that, you know, maybe you can't get that one big grocery store to come in there, but you can get, I don't know, eight out of 10 of them leased to small businesses, which is much better for everybody who lives near there. Yeah, but think about all the plumbing risers you have to install. You got to do oh, all right. the extra electrical equipment. You know, I, I do feel like the finance aspect of this is under-discussed. Yeah, that's a fair point. Exactly where are building owners prepared to take a hit 
or where their financers are prepared to take a hit in order to just sort of simplify the portfolio. Yeah, actually, that was really interesting yeah. getting totally off topic here. But when we were living in Toronto at one point, my wife was working for a commercial real estate company that did developments. And what was really interesting about that with respect to mixed use development, because mixed use development was illegal in so much of North America for so long, right. the developers just don't know how to do it. And so you have like commercial real estate <laughs> developers who do, you know, like retail, and then you have ones that do industrial, and then you have ones that do retail, but different types of retail. And then you have ones that do residential, and they literally don't know how to do a project together. Like the whole company is only set up to do, say, only residential. So then when they try to do commercial, they just can't. They don't have the people. The people who do the financial modeling don't know how to model it. The people who do the investment raising don't know how to raise the investment. They talk to the banks and the banks were like, I don't understand what this is. This doesn't fit. Yeah, yeah this doesn't make sense. And it, yeah. It's such a funny thing that, you know, we talk about, oh, we should bring back mixed use development. But then when you actually get into the weeds of it, the banks don't know how to finance it. The developers don't know how to build it. Nobody knows what they're doing. And it's kind of shocking. It's like that knowledge has been lost to the ages. I worked at the Philadelphia Housing Authority for a short period right. of time. And one of the big projects we were doing, the Sharswood Blumberg Tower replacement project, they're going to tear down these two big old fashioned towers in the park towers. They were going to replace that with row houses. Mm -hmm. But part of the development was like, we need to address this food desert in the area acquired some property to do so. And they're like, well, we're going to put some apartments on top of the grocery store. This is fairly obvious and easy. Right. And no grocery store would move in. No one wanted to partner with the project because they're like, no, we need a big grocery store with a parking lot in right. front so people can see the sign because they're driving on Long Ridge Avenue, which is obviously going to be all the people who just drive on Ridge Avenue will stop in the grocery store. No, this doesn't make any sense at all. But that's what they wanted. Well, I mean, that's the way they're set <laughs> up. Eventually it got built that way. Yeah. I mean, it does remind me when we first lived in Toronto and we didn't have a car, whenever that would come up in conversation with somebody, the number one question we were asked all the time was, but how do you buy groceries? They don't understand. North Americans don't understand that it is possible to buy groceries without a car. They're not that heavy. You can walk. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> when I discuss this with people in Europe or Asia, like we used to live in Taiwan, they'd be like, what are you talking about? I like never use a car to buy. Why? Why would I use a car to buy groceries? It's like two blocks away. I know. Away. It's like, why would I get my car to go down? I can carry a gallon <laughs> of milk that far. <laughs> I don't think I could do that in Canada because of the whole bagged milk situation. I'd be terrified, but <laughs> Hey, you know what? Bagged milk is superior and I will die on that hill, but that'll have to be a podcast episode of its own someday. We would be here for probably 45 <laughs> minutes if we talked about that. I could talk about bagged milk for a while. It's only parts of Canada that have the bagged milk for what it's worth, listeners. It's not all parts of Canada. So I don't need you people over in Alberta telling me you don't use bagged milk. I know that. I know you are inferior <laughs> over there in the West, but... Anyway, back to row houses. <laughs> yes, this is a podcast about row houses. <laughs> Without slides. So yeah. the one last thing, we're kind of coming to a close here. I know we could probably talk about row houses all day. Yes. But we're going to cap this, I think, pretty soon. But the other thing I want to say about it is it is really the perfect form factor for also subdividing those floors into apartments and then also turning them back into row houses in the future. And I get the impression that that's kind of what you live in. Yes. So my house is one apartment, first floor, two on the second floor and one on the third floor. That's interesting. It's easy to subdivide them this way. You got like one plumbing riser. They're set up in such a way, and they're flexible enough that it's relatively easy to subdivide. Most of them were subdivided sometime, at least in Philly, most of them were subdivided in like, you know, the 60s and 70s right. or earlier than that even, you know, especially since I'm in a big rambling Victorian style row house. So, you know, there's a lot of space. Luxury. But the form factor does mean that if you want to subdivide it into apartments, that's fairly easy. And you don't even get small apartments out of it. You get pretty big apartments generally. Right. And they're pretty cross-ventilated. And they are very livable. I have never lived in like a really shitty apartment in Philly. I've barely even seen one. Yeah, that's interesting. I find that row houses do make for pretty good apartments in the grand scheme of things. Again, they are cross-ventilated. We talked about that already. And I think it's interesting. I remember when I first moved to Amsterdam, I was walking through this one fairly wealthy neighborhood here. And... It was interesting to see that there's all these row houses and you're never quite sure if this is like, you know, four apartments or if it's like an entire rich person's top to bottom massive house. 
until you go right up to them and see how many doorbells they have. Yeah. <laughs> but what I also find is interesting about it is there'll be one with four doorbells, four names. Very clearly, this is a big four-story house that's been turned into four apartments. And literally right next to it, like their neighbors attached by the wall, are a single apartment of someone who must be extraordinarily wealthy to live in that particular neighborhood in this four-story massive home. And that's also a nice thing that people of different yeah. socioeconomic status can live right next to one another in the same neighborhood, as opposed to this idea where you go and you build this suburb and every single house costs whatever, $500,000. And so everybody comes in all at exactly the same socioeconomic status and those never change and it stays that way forever. Yeah, I mean, it is good to provide housing for people of multiple income levels, though, obviously. I personally advocate for full communism now. Of course. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the form factor works in such a way that it is very easy to subdivide, so it is easy to provide housing to people of various income levels. My neighborhood has historically been generally pretty wealthy, but even considering that, the rent is pretty cheap. Hmm. And that is interesting, right? Like, because a lot of American cities are going through, like, crippling housing crises right now. Certainly when you look at, like, where I used to live in Silicon Valley, oh my God. Yeah. But that is, like, the yeah. worst case scenario. I cannot believe Silicon Valley is still all single-family detached homes throughout the entire region. I lived there right. in 98 and 99, and the housing prices were insane then. And they have only gotten worse way worse way worse i've never been out there but i have looked at it on google maps a lot and i was like wow these people have the highest technology in the world but they've never invented a two-story building yet it's shocking <laughs> everything is a one-story bungalow with the garage attached on the side that is like frozen in time in the 1960s and despite the fact that housing prices have just gone insane there for decades they just will not change and it's not even nice housing either, to be honest. Like those no. bungalows are actually kind of crappy. I've been in quite a lot of them, but they're frozen in time because of zoning. Well, you know, zoning works extremely well at preserving property values, and that's what counts. <laughs> <sighs> well, that's a trick, isn't it? But that's a whole podcast to itself. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> my advice is to bulldoze all of Silicon Valley and build row houses as far as the eye can see. Yeah, probably, uh, that's clearly probably, the only yeah, solution would, to our problem. I would instantly nuke the place. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, row houses, the superior form of housing, every city should have them, or at the very least, it should be legal to build them everywhere. That's the trick, right? It is insane that there are lots and lots of places in North America where it's just illegal to build this kind of housing. People talk about like legalizing ADUs and it's like, okay, that's fine. You know, you can have a little granny flat in the back, but just make it legal to build row houses. I'm just say, listen, I can have one house per one eighth of an acre or whatever 15 by nine is everywhere in the United States. Right. Boom. Done. Elect me president. I will enact this instantly. And suddenly you've got densities that are close to that of Paris. Yeah, exactly. That don't feel dense at all. Problem solved. Everyone would have a nice row house. Row houses, the solution to all the world's problems. Basically, yeah. I mean, that would just be world peace, hunger ended because we'll have more agricultural land. True. We haven't even talked about that. I'm not sure how we end nuclear weapon proliferation this way, but probably we would. <laughs> Talking to your neighbors more often, I think, does that. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a podcast. I love row houses, yes. and you should too. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Justin. If you are listening to this, make sure you check out the podcast. Well, there's your problem. It's a podcast about engineering disasters with slides that Justin does yes. on a regular basis. Yeah, regular ish. It comes out once a week ish. Regular ish basis. It comes out more often than this podcast does. Anyway. I'm staying with it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they are very, very close to getting their silver play button on YouTube. So head over there to Well, There's Your Problem and subscribe, even if you don't watch it, just so that they can get their they can get their award to hang on their wall. Yeah, we're trying to figure out who gets it. <laughs> well, when you get it, you can order extras for what it's worth. I know, I know. And I have but never the, looked into the, that the... because I am just me. But uh, I just got my gold play button the other day, and it has a little thing that says, if you want to order more, email this. Email the free one is the one that matters. <laughs> of course it is. I would actually hate to think about how much those things cost, because I bet they're like, this is free, and if you want another one, it's $6,000. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll report back when it happens. <laughs> All right. You let me know. And I'll be happy to have you on the podcast yeah. again sometime. Oh, yeah, we can talk time. about something other than row houses, but inevitably row houses will come up because they are, after all, the superior form of housing. Yes.
That's all we have on the agenda for today. I hope you enjoyed listening to it almost as much as we enjoyed making it. I really enjoy talking to other content creators about what they find interesting, and a lot of the people I have on this podcast I met since joining Nebula. Nebula is the subscription streaming service created by and for educational content creators and the people who love their content. Nebula has all sorts of educational content, from videos to podcasts to classes by your favorite creators, as well as Nebula Originals, which are high-budget productions. Honestly, Nebula is such a great platform, and I'm so happy for my content to be available there. If you use our special link, which is nebula.tv slash agenda, you'll get a discount off an annual membership, which comes to only $30 a year, which I think is a fantastic deal. So check out Nebula at nebula.tv slash agenda and see if there's something of interest to you. At the very least, you'll be able to hear every episode of The Urbanist Agenda a little bit earlier than everyone else so you can get the inside scoop on what we're plotting and scheming. Thanks again for listening, and maybe next time you'll be listening on Nebula.